Um, well, good afternoon, first of all. Um, so let, let me, you know, give you a few words about the title. Uh, so this morning, we had a long session about strong TADF emitters, yeah? Um, and so, you know, to avoid a bit of being boring, because, you know, the emitter works so nicely, uh, I decided to give you an alternative view, right? So we are not going to see any good emitter here for an OLED, right? But we are going to see materials that we can learn about, yeah? So all this, not all, but uh, most of the things that you saw this morning in terms of mechanism, in terms of what uh, directs us, you know, to design the, these let's say, good TADF emitters, came in part for the study that we did some years ago in materials that show very, well, not very poor, but weak TADF, right? Also, these room temperature phosphorescence without metals that are, you know, is important for other type of applications. Uh, in devices itself, at the moment, they are not relevant, and that's because the, the lifetime is long, and so you suffer a lot of quenching. There is one paper that I, well, one or two, but one paper that I know from Adachi group with the afterglow OLEDs, where room temperature phosphorescence is used with the efficiency maybe below 1% or so. Uh, so that's not the purpose here, yeah? The other thing that we have is that when we have room temperature phosphorescence, we are learning about the inter-system crossing process, mainly. Right? And if we learn about that, we also learn about the reverse process. Because the mechanism should be the same, a part of the, the energy barrier or the energy gap that you have there. So that's the purpose that we are going to uh, do here this afternoon. And also I want to direct this talk mostly to the lab. Yeah? It's like if we are going to give a lab tour and we are going to see what we do every day when we get a new material. Right? So that's the purpose. So what I need to do first, let's see if I can align myself with these two things here. Um, let me give you a bit of a, well, introduction first in terms of nomenclature that I need to use later on, so I don't need to be repeating myself all the time. Um, and then we will go through some motivation, yeah, some a few slides about the motivation to study these type of molecules. And later on, if time allows, we will go through uh, two examples, yeah, on, on the photophysics of these type of materials. So, uh, everybody here knows this stuff. We are in all labs. We have, we form this 25% singlet state, 75% triplet states. And the arena here is that we are trying to get ways to harvest these otherwise dark states. That's what we are trying to do, yeah? And, and we can do this in two ways, right? We can use the phosphorus channel, which most people do quite efficiently when they put metals. So they, they promote inter-system crossing between this triplet state and the ground state, which should, is a singlet. Or you can go the other way around. You can grab these triplets, up-convert them to the singlet state, and then they will decay radiatively. That's what we are trying to do. But there is always a competition here, yeah? There is a competition, really, between the up-conversion to the singlet state and the decay to the ground state, yeah? That channel is there still, and it will play a role, right? So, now, let's start with this first emitter that we are, you, you have seen already. So the first thing that we notice when we start with the ADF emitters is that we need, or most of them, or 100% of them, are city, uh, they form city states. So they form charge transfer states. So they are, they are done with some electron donor unit and an electron acceptor. And there is no reason for that other than the fact that we want to minimize the gap between the singlet and the triplet, right? And we do it using electron donor and acceptor to decrease the overlap between the 
homo and lumo orbitals. That's why we need a city state. Otherwise, if the molecule has a very small band gap, uh, single gap between singlet and triplet, if that would be possible, nothing stops the TADF to occur anyway. Right? It doesn't because if there is a, not a city state, then the gap usually is quite large. Right? But it could be possible if we separate them in some way with some spacers or whatever, that would be possible potentially. So, once we have that, and optically, when we excite this mo optical, uh, the molecule in an optical way, we populate the singlet state, right? And so the first thing that we do is to check if we have really a charge transfer state there. And when we do that, we do it usually looking at how, the, sol how the, the emission changes with the polarity of the solvent, right? That gives us a clear indication if there is a, a strong solvatochromism, we say, yeah, we have a good city state here. Right? Um, also, when we populate this singlet state, of course, then intersystem crossing will bring some triplets down, right? With, with this rate, the rate of intersystem crossing. And I call this Fit here the triplet, the, yield, the triplet yield. So the yield of triplets that are formed, which is basically this rate divided by the rate itself, well, times the lifetime of the singlet state, right? <laughs> now, these triplets, some of them, you know, if you write here some vibrational uh, levels, there is like a, you can assume there is a fast equilibrium there, and the fraction of these triplets that are isoenergetic with the singlet, they will go back using reverse intersystem crossing. And once they go back, using this rate, so we call this phi s here the yield of singlets that are coming from triplet states, right? And so these singlets then they will decay and with a delayed emission because why, why is that delayed emission? Because this emission is coming from the triplet state. So the lifetime of, of this uh, TADF process, this, the lifetime of this luminescence, should be exactly the lifetime of the triplet state, because it's that state that is feeding the other, right? So when you look at the decay, what you have is what we call a prompt component, so it's the decay of the initially created singlet states, right? And then later, the singlets that appeared from the triplet state will appear and will decay with the lifetime that is the lifetime of the triplet state, right? And there is a competition here, yeah? So there is the, re the reverse intersystem crossing going up and the radiative decay of the triplet state and the internal conversion, if you want to call it like that, from the triplet state itself, right? So ideally what we want to do is to minimize whatever quenches the triplet population to give it a a better chance to be promoted to the singlet state and maximize this rate here, right? That would be the ideal situation. So in practical terms, what we get, we go to this decay, and so once we know the prompt uh, fluorescence, we can integrate this component, which will give us what we call the PF, so the prompt fluorescence. We go to this one, we integrate this component, which give us the DF, and the ratio between them is a very important parameter, right? And I will show you why in a minute. So in this case, you see you have 5%, right? 5% is nothing, right? If you go and you look at this emission in steady state, right, and you change the temperature, you are not going to see almost anything, right? Because the, the fraction that you have of this DF component is 5%, yeah? It's nothing, right? While if you go for, for a strong emitter, you are going to see a huge change with temperature, right? So, why is that uh, ratio important? Well, it, it gives a lot of inf information. So, if we go to this diagram here, again, what we can imagine is that there is really 
a recycling process here. Yeah? So singlets go down, form triplets, a fraction of these triplets will go up. When they arrive here, some of them will decay, others will go back to the triplet state, and so on and so on. Yeah, that's, we, should, we have to have to imagine like that. So if we do this calculation, the total fluorescence that we get is going to be the sum of the prompt fluorescence that we see over there plus the delayed fluorescence. And so this delayed fluorescence appears. So you have this prompt fluorescence here. Then the delayed one is, of course, the triplet yield. Remember that. So the delayed fluorescence depends on the amount of triplets that you form. Then from that number, a fraction of it will go back to the singlet state, and that is the phi s. And finally, a fraction of those will emit. Right? And you keep going. Right? And finally, you have a series. As, and if you sum this series with an infinite number of steps, you arrive or you reach to this expression here, which you can then work out and have an expression for the ratio of df over pf as a function of the triplet yield and the yield of those triplets that arrive to singlet, or the singlets that come from the triplet state. right? And that's really important, because after you do a bit of maths, you, so, you express this product here, the triplet yield times the yield of the singlet states that, come, that came from the triplet state as a function of this ratio. Right? That's why we want to determine this ratio. All right? And a lot of the work we do is exactly to, do, to determine that ratio. So in this case, because this ratio is just 5%, you put it there, and the product of your triplet yield times the yield of singlets that came from triplet state is really about 5%. Very low. If on top of that, you determine the triplet yield, which here was done in exam, so a non-polar solvent, you end up with just 17% of your triplets manage to go to the singlet state in this molecule. Right? This ratio, the 5%, the was determined in ethanol. Right? So this situation is not real let's say, because of course the triplet yield might change if you change the solvent where you are working, right? So I expect a slightly larger triplet yield in ethanol, and so the fraction of triplets that we convert to singlets in this material, just a moment, will be slightly larger. Yep? You can, in this case, you have to rely in flash photolysis yeah? techniques, right? It's quite complex. We will go for that. I can explain a while. Yeah? You, can, you can do two things. Uh, or you use um, re ground state recovery. So basically, you excite with one beam, and then you bring another one on the photo bleaching, right? And you, looking at the intensity of the transmitted light, you get a, a way to measure the the fraction of singlets that you form are in the triplet state. Yeah? But it's quite complicated. I, I, will, I will explain it later. Right. So we are not brilliant here in this one. All right? So now that we are in this stuff, what I plotted here right, is a fantastic table which shows here the yield of uh, singlets that or the fraction of triplets that go to singlet state, and here the triplet yield, right? And these numbers here are the, t, the product of phi t phi s for different ratios of the FPF, right? So for example, for a ratio of three, yeah? So if your df component over the pf is three, you are with a, a, a phi, t, phi s product that is, uh, well, this, the ratio gives 0.75. So you are in this uh, red rectangle, which means that the phi, phi, phi t times phi s 
would be around 0.64 or 0.8, whatever, right? Why is that important? Well, it's important because if you look now and you look at this blue uh, rectangle, as soon as you reach ratios, the FPF ratios that are above four, right? If they are above four, you just have four options here, right? So that means if your phi t has to be i and your phi s has to be i as well, all right? So with a simple measurement, if I measure the DFPF ratio, I can have a good idea what is the triplet yield and what is the, the yield of triplets that go back to singlet, all right? And that makes my life very, very easy, right? Well, not very easy, but it helps, right? So that's, that's what we need. If we are in systems like the one before, where the DFPF ratio is almost nothing, you are somewhere here and you don't know, right? That, that, that is exactly, exactly the situation. You don't know the triplet yield and you don't know the yield of, sing, of triplets that go back to the singlet state. So you rely on the determination of the triplet yield, which is a crucial parameter then, and a very difficult one to determine, all right? So that's why in the TADF uh, area, let's say, the materials that give strong TADF are the easiest ones to study. We can determine everything quite easily, not in the others, yeah? So, but we have a bit more on this, on this type of things. So if we go back to this equation again, right? And now, if we are in a region where this DFPF range is above four, right? As I show on that table, we can assume quite confidently that the phi s is one. Yeah, if it is not one, it will be 0.85 or whatever. Yeah, I will live happy with that, all right? So if the phi s is one, we can determine the phi t immediately, right? is the easiest way to determine the fit, okay? So simply, you go and you measure the DFPF ratio and you have the fit, right? Fantastic stuff, right? And from that, you know fit because you measure the fluorescence lifetime, then you determine the intersystem crossing rate, which uh, is also another important parameter, all right? Now, because when you look at these decays, prompt and delayed fluorescence, well, basically, this, the kinetics of these decays is equivalent to the kinetics of excimer states, which was described in the 60s by Burks, really. So it's a, it's a system that we know quite well, and we can derive quite easily the solution, right, in terms of so for the long component in terms of the rate constants that are involved in the system. Now, the denominator here, you can simply say that, of course, the risk rate is slower than the radiative rate. Yeah, that's always true for sure, right? Well, you have a, a risk rate maximum at 10 to 6, and you should have a fluorescence rate around, let's say, 10 to 8, something like that, usually. So with a good approxim approximation, let's say like that, yeah? So we can neglect that, and when we neglect that, we end up with an expression for the risk rate as a function only on the yield, well, on the yield of the trip, on the fraction of triplets that go back to singlet, and again, the DFPF ratios and the lifetime. So everything we can measure and we can determine this rate quite easily again, all right? And that's exactly what we did, right? For, for this material 2K, that's exactly what we did. So we can characterize this system quite easily, right? When there's a good TADF emitter again. Now, because of that, 
we could go then to optimize structures. Yeah? You saw this this morning. So we put these two phenothiazines in the same acceptor. The phenothiazines are quite nice donors because they align perpendicularly to the acceptor. Let's forget all those you know, situations that can happen with some isomers and all that stuff. But in this one, we were quite fortunate, so we could do that quite easily. And now you see, well, we did calculations as well to see how the, the, <coughs> the gap between singlet and triplet will uh, change with, the, with this diadro angle. And of course, singlet and triplet get almost isoenergetic at 90 degrees, which is exactly the situation that we have, right? Well, here, of course, the calculations assume that the geometry in the excited state is the ground state geometry. Yeah, that's what we have to live with that. Anyway, so when then we look at, at steady state, you see the difference now. The previous compound, you had 5%. If you do this experiment, you wouldn't see almost any change. With this one, you have a ratio between the gas in the solution, so the triplets can contribute, divided by the emission in the presence of oxygen, so no triplet contribution is there, and you have 12, right? So if you subtract one, because under the gas one, both PF and DF contribute, right? You end up with 11, right? A DF-PF ratio that is 11, clearly that is PS1, according with the table that we just uh, discussed. And so if yes, one, you can calculate or estimate the triplet yield at 92%, right? And now we know the fluorescence yield that you can measure. You know the triplet yield, so you can go and determine all the rates that you need. Um, so that's exactly what we did. So we could determine, that's quite easily, looking at the fluorescence and phosphorescence, you can, well, not in all systems, but at least in this one, we could identify where the energy of the triplet state, the energy of the singlet state, so we have the gap, as we predicted, should be quite small, and it is, and we could determine all the rates that we need. So we have the system fully characterized, let's say. Right? So I was quite happy with this stuff. Now, there are some more things that we should look at, again, with the same kind of equations. So if we go back to this equation here, right? The one over there. And now we try to calculate what would be the maximum fluorescence yield that we can have. Right? As a function of phi t and phi s. And because we are looking at the maximum, I'm saying that the phi f or the phi pf will be 1 minus the phi t. Right? So the only thing that I'm neglecting the internal conversion, basically. Yeah? I'm looking at the maximum possible emission that I can have. And I do this diagram as a function of phi t and phi s. Right? So this is exactly the same table as before. Yeah? It's another representation. So what we see, ah, and the color gives the, well, the intensity, let's say, in, within some range. Right? So the red is the more intense. It's close to 1. So if phi t is 0, right? So you don't form triplets. I'm neglecting the internal conversion. The fluorescence yield should be 1. And it is. That's why we have all these red all this re red region, right? But now remember one thing. If, a, if we have a strong TADF emitter, right? When we study this emitter using optical excitation, is because the triplets have to contribute a lot, right? If the triplets have to contribute a lot, is because phi T has to be I. All right? So what is happening is that the, the strong TADF emitters that we select 
using optical excitation, you know, are on this region. Yeah? Really this corner is the ones that have strong Phi-T and strong phi -S. All right? We are really here. It's just, so the, let's say, the range that we have to allow some variation on the phi -S is very limited. Right? So that's not a good situation. We are selecting molecules which do not allow the phi -S to fail. Yeah? When we look at these strong TADF emitters. All right? Nothing wrong with that. It's just how it is. But we know that even in that situation, we do lose triplets. Right? We do. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. At least that's what it seems we see. So this is the 2K. You go to Tolwyn. doesn't matter here. It could be in other, in other medium. By other reasons that I'm not discussing now, Andy already did that. When we go to Tolwyn, the ratio that it was 12 now is 3. Yeah? But that's not what is important at the moment. What is important is that once we deuterate the acceptor, for example, so we make these vibrations, CH, more energetic, right? We see that the FPF ratio goes up. All right? Sorry? Yeah, all right, okay. So, we see that going up, all right? And that happens in solvent, but also in Xionax, right? So this, I'm not saying this is confirmed. I'm, I'm showing here really some fresh data, by the way, right? So we are in the lab, remember? Uh, and in the lab, we are, we are allowed to, to have, you know, strange ideas, all right? which we can change later, right? So at the moment, what it seems, right, is that once we suppress some internal conversion, we do improve the triplet harvesting. So remember what, what we did. We went to a situation where any change on the FIAS was not allowed because we went to high triplet yield and still we lose some, right? So that indicates that we can improve the efficiency of this process, right? Now, this is using optical excitation. And if we go into devices, what happens? Is it the same thing? Let's see. So in devices, what we have is that we formed 25% singlets that behave in the normal way. And then we have 75% triplets that also have to go back to the singlet, then decay, and going back to the triplet, and coming back, and so on. So you do exactly the same trick, and you end up with this equation here. Yeah, we have seen this equation before here, so it's right, okay? And um, again, I will do the same trick, right? I neglect internal conversion. And so you have this expression, and we go and plot it. So, when we look at the prompt emission, of course, it behaves exactly in the same way as before, as the optical excitation. But, of course, the red now corresponds to 25%. Yeah, that's the, the singlets that you have initially. When you go to the delayed, delayed component, again, you see, you go to I triplet yield, right? That's what we had on that molecule, on the 2K, the very good TADF emitter. The triplet yield is I, so again, we are in this corner, right? But there is potential, it seems, that if we manage to have a molecule that has a, like, 10% triplet yield, we would have more range for the phi -S to, to vary and still have maximum efficiency, right? So that would be good, right? So when we put the two things together, so the total EL, it gives exactly the, the same pattern, right? If we can work at low fitties, would be better. It seems, right? It seems. Remember, we are in the lab, all right? So it seems that 
if we manage to uncouple the phi t and the phi s, right, then we can tune independently these two parameters and we would arrive to a, a region where we have more freedom for the phi s to change and still achieve 100%, right? So, moreover, if we go to the lifetime, right, the lifetime of the DF, it is also a function of phi s and phi t. And if phi t decreases, the lifetime decreases. And that is also good for devices, right? A fast decay is better than a long decay. That's why I cannot use my room temperature phosphorescence materials and devices, right? So, it seems then that the best TADF emitter for a device would be a material that doesn't show TADF in optical excitation. Yeah, that's, that's good, right? So, all my stuff that I do using optical excitation would be, right? Well, that's not true, so. Right. Now, the question is, if we remember the intersystem crossing rate and the reverse intersystem crossing rate, they have to be related, yeah? They have to be related. They are proportional in some way, right? So, is this just maths or can we really uncouple these two things? I don't know. However, so Mario Nuno, I don't know, well, some of you know him. Uh, Mario Nuno is a Portuguese colleague and he published this paper recently exactly doing this analysis that I just described, yeah? So, it was not my idea, the analysis that I just described, right? So, this has been done. So, read the paper. I think it's a quite good paper about that. And, um, and he arrived to the same question, right? So, he made exactly the question that is important. Can we really uncouple these two things or not? Okay? He gave an answer already. And to give an answer to that, what he did, he looked at results in the literature, right? So he built up this diagram, which is equivalent to the, the diagram that I just showed you, but is in the opposite way, phi t, phi s, that matter. Um, and then you have these red squares, red circles, and so on, yeah? So the circles means efficiency, yeah? in a device above 75% internal efficiency, all right? And what is so is that, for example, these green emitters here, five and six, they have a very low phi t. This is in a paper, Adachi's paper, yeah? So they have low phi t, but still high phi s, and so good EL. All right? The same happens to compound number three. Then you have compound number one, which behaves as, uh, but that is already on the region where phi t and phi s are both i. All right? So the message here is that I don't know the reason, right? Don't know. I did, to be honest, I didn't look, I didn't have time to look at the papers to check how this phi t was determined, right? If this is correct, then it proves that it's possible, okay? I've been, you know, trying to think or come up with a mechanism that we could propose to design molecules where this phi t and phi s would be uncoupled. I came with one already here, and then I was talking with Karsten, and, uh, well, it came a bit, you know, because, well, other reasons, so I prefer not to put it here, right? The, the idea that I have, or the feeling, the intuition that I have, is that to achieve something like that, we need to have the molecule or the conformation where the triplet, the intersystem crossing occurs, would be different from the conformation where the reverse intersystem crossing occurs. That's the intuition that I have, right? And take it as it is, right? 
So, a good thing to do is to look at these materials, right, five and six, and see what's going on over there, right? So that's what, what I, I will try to do. All right? So, kinetically, it's perfectly possible to uncouple these things. If you look at this thing, yeah, if you look at the definitions of phi t and phi s, and you put numbers on that thing, you go and you say, yeah, this is the decay of my singlet state, right? Let's put 10 to 8, Psych second minus 1, seconds minus 1, right? So 10 to 8 here, and if I use 10 to 7 to the intersystem crossing, I will have a phi t around 10%, right? Just do the maths, it's 10%. Then with 10 to 7 here, if I use for the risk 10 to 6, which is all right, okay? And if I use 10 to 3 for the, the decay of the triplet state in the absence of reverse intersystem crossing, I'm going to have phi s equal 1. So kinetically is possible, all right? Now, how to design it, I don't know, okay? But that gives me the motivation, and that's what I need to go to the lab and try to understand how this triplet yield and reverse intersystem crossing yield work. Yeah? And I think we still have a lot to do to understand how the confirmation uh, controls these two processes, right? So, and that's my motivation to study room temperature phosphorescence emitters, right? Because those ones, they are much simpler, right? They are not good to devices yet. Maybe never will go, yeah? Never will reach that, that application. But because they don't require a city state, that's the first thing. So they are easy to understand in some way. And we can do some nice stuff with them, right? So, what we did, starting now with the, our two phenotizins, and now the dibenzo without the two oxygens, right? This is very fresh results, yeah? Rong Zhuan did, she's there. She will put a poster tomorrow, I think, yeah? So you can discuss all this with her. Um, and these are results, you know, two weeks time or something, right? So, what we have here? We do the usual thing, and so that's a good way to see how we approach a new material. So, we have the molecule, and here you have the absorption, right? And what you see here is that the black uh, spectra is the absorption spectra of the molecule, right? Of this DPTZ, DBT. Then you have the blue one, which is the acceptor. Right? The acceptor unit only, separated. And the red one is the phenotizing. This absorption is done in toluene, right? But can be done in something else. Yeah, that's not a huge change. Then you have the emission, the blue one, so it's the emission of the acceptor. It's quite high in energy. And you have the fluorescence of the donor, phenotizing and the fluorescence of the, emit of the old molecule, right? So what we see immediately is that if we change the solvent, we have some CT state in this one, yeah? Not so strong as we have when we have the sulfon group here, but still there, are, there is some CT state, which is good. Well, not good or bad, doesn't matter. So, now, as soon as we go to Zionex, so a solid film, we excite here, yeah? We are exciting at 355 most of the times, yeah? And as soon as we excite at 355, you see that we are only exciting the phenotizing, yeah? If you look there, we are exciting here, yeah? So we only excite the donor unit, yeah? We have quite good control on these on this type of things, right? We excite just the donor, we don't excite the acceptor at the moment. 
And we see fluorescence, right, that matches perfectly the fluorescence of the donor. All right? If we put it in Zionex, so a solid film, and this is steady state fluorescence. It's done in a normal fluorimeter, you know, not, not a gated system or whatever. What we do see, we see a strong phosphorescence at room temperature without any metal, yeah? Strong phosphorescence collected in a simple fluorimeter. We put oxygen, the oxygen quenches the triplets, phosphorescence is gone. And we, do, we know that this phosphorescence, I will show in the next slide, is exactly the fluorescence from the donor. All right? So we are doing everything in the donor. Right? And we do see this lifetime. You see, that's what kills me. Yeah? This lifetime is milliseconds. Well, kills me, kills me in terms of going to devices. Yeah? I would like to you know, play it in devices. Yeah? Um, and I will do so, but I have no many hopes that it will work. So, now, when we go to this thing, we now look at time-resolved spectra. Look what we have here. So, we have, in blue, is the phosphorescence of the acceptor, right? In here, we have the phosphorescence of our material and the phosphorescence of the donor, yeah? So, and here, isoenergetic with the, with the phosphorescence of the acceptor is the fluorescence of the donor, right? Which also matches the fluorescence of the isolated donor, okay? So we can build up this diagram quite easily, yeah? And the diagram, well, let me turn here, yeah? The diagram, what we have is that we excite the donor phenotyazine, and we excite this Frank condom initially. The phenotyazine relax. You see it here, yeah? You see the stoke shift of just of the phenotyazine. So the phenotyazine itself, it relax. It changed the geometry between ground and excited state. And so that's why this singlet state of the phenotyazine comes down, right? And now it comes down. And we call the CT, well, we call the emissive state of our molecule, donor receptor donor, as a CT, and is isoenergetic with the singlet state of the donor. Right? Now, the triplet state of the receptor is also isoenergetic with that one. Okay? So we have a nice system, yeah? And we have then the triplet state of the donor which is, of course, isoenergetic with the triplet state of our emitter, right? So, to summarize, what we are doing is that we excite the phenotyazine, right? The phenotyazine relaxes, right? Gives triplets and really doesn't care about the acceptor for anything, right? It doesn't care. Well, initially, when I saw this stuff, I said, wow, this triplet here is isoenergetic with this state, yeah, that's the good thing. For sure, this, you know, because it's isoenergetic, is going to promote the intersystem crossing. Right? Well, as soon as we looked at the normal phenotyazine, the isolated phenotyazine, we realized that is, well, probably is not true. The phenotyazine itself, you see, this one appears in the same thing, and the, the well, it's not here, but the phosphorescence really matches that one, yeah? So the phenotyazine itself has a strong phosphorescence yield. Well, well just, just a bit, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, so that, that's important, okay? Now, what we did, because we want to control these things, we went to our phenotyazine, right? And we, do, we did this usual trick, yeah? We put some bulky side groups there, and let's try to interact with this thing, right? Remember the motivation we wanted to see what happens if we make this relaxation from one state to the other slower, right? So, in the phenotyazine itself, if I put these side groups, 
For the emission, nothing happens. Doesn't care about it. For the absorption, well, is a bit unstabilized. So while the, the ionization potentially gets a bit, it goes down a bit, slightly. Yeah? So that's interesting. Then we go and we build up this molecule, right? So we have now phenothiazine with these terbutyl groups over there. And when they try to rotate, they start clashing with each other, possibly, right? Well, we know that happens from the other materials, yeah? So what is interesting now is that if you look at this absorption and emission, look now, the red is the absorption of the phenothiazine with the terbutal group, yeah? Doesn't change. The blue is the absorption of the acceptor, doesn't change. However, the absorption of this material, it changes a lot. You see now this emission, this absorption here? Yeah? Well, I heard a, a lot of people, when they saw these kind of things, they say, ah, it's a charge transfer state. It's not. It's not. I can show you that it's not. I don't know why people create this idea that if you have an extra bond, it's a city state. It's not. Right? And I will show you why. So, you have the same fluorescence from the acceptor, and now you have, this is the fluorescence of the substituted phenothiazine alone, and this is the fluorescence of our material. You see the fluorescence now is blue shifted, right? And the stoke shift between this absorption and the fluorescence is almost nothing, right? So we are making this rearrangement of the excited state geometry more and more difficult, right? And I, get, I tell you that what we did is in the phenothiazine itself, right? The phenothiazine, as Andy showed this morning, when it goes from the ground to the excited state, is bent and probably relaxed in some way. As soon as we have the phenothiazine in this molecule, it cannot do that. And because it cannot do that, the ionization potential goes up, so the gap yeah, the gap decreases, and that's why we see this extra band, right? And the reason why I say that is because there is no CT whatsoever. Yeah, this is the emission in different solvents, no CT whatsoever. And you have the extra band, right? Now, the phosphorescence, and I need to finish this stuff, the phosphorescence is also now at high energies. And now, look at it, overlaps with the phosphorescence of the acceptor. Right? You see, this is the phosphorescence of the single donor with the terbutyl group. And now the phosphorescence of, of our molecule comes at high energies as well. So we shift everything to high energies. So we can now go and look to the diagram and compare both. Yeah? So this one I already explained. In this one now, what happens is that we excite the phenothiazine in the Frank condom, but now there is no relaxation. We blocked all the relaxation, right? So our emissive state is at slightly lower energies than before, but there is no relaxation, right? And so fluorescence occurs from that. The phosphorescence now occurs from the acceptor, right? Or, or, and now I have this question that I still uh, didn't manage to answer. So, we have two options. Or the phosphorescence comes from the high energy triplet and doesn't relax to the low triplet, right, of the phenotizing. Or, this triplet doesn't exist anymore or is never populated as this singlet is not populated as well, right? So you just have now the triplet of the, of the acceptor, and probably the triplet of the phenotizing is somewhere, somewhere here, right? So we managed to shift green to blue phosphorescence by putting these side groups and creating a very rigid chromophore, right? Well, I, I, I have more 20 slides, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so I finish here. That would be the next work. 
and now I will tell you about that next opportunity. Right? Thank you.